everyone. My name is uh, Carl Payer. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Agri-Food uh, Innovation Council, and I'll be your uh, moderator today. Welcome to the third panel of our virtual summit on agri-food research and innovation, looking ahead to 2025. Or welcome back if you had uh, also join us uh, during panel one and two. I'd like to start by uh, thanking Osler, Hoskin, and our court LLP, Farm Credit Canada, AgWest Bio, and Smith, Petri, Carr, and Scott Insurance Brokers for partnering with us for this event. Thank you. Today's panel focuses on uh, presentations from Canada's agri-science clusters. And before we begin with our presentations, I just have a few uh, technical notes uh, to share. Uh, as you'll notice, uh, the chat bar will not be active for the attendees. That being said, you're welcome to ask your questions using the Q&A button. If you see a question that's been asked by another attendee that you like, you may uh, upvote it in order to uh, move it up in the queue. If you prefer to ask your question verbally, please feel free to use the raise hand button that's located right next to the Q&A button. And once you're identified, you'll be asked to unmute yourself uh, to ask your question. I will now invite Mr. Neil Ellis, Parliamentary Secretary of, uh, to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to say a few words. Mr. Ellis was uh, elected as the few MP for the Bay of uh, Quinte riding in 2015. From 2015 to 2019, he served as a chair of the Standing Committee on Veteran Affairs. And following his uh, re-election in 2019, he was named in his uh, current position as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. And uh, prior to becoming an MP, Mr. Ellis uh, served as the mayor of uh, the city of Belleville from 20, 2006 to uh, 2014. Mr. Ellis, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Minister, Honorable Minister Marie-Claude Bibeau, Canada's Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, I'm honored to join you here today. The Council has been a strong voice for agri-food research and innovation for over a year. And your name, your new name since 2019 certainly reflects the passion. As Serge told us during an appearance at the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food, Canada is a nation of innovation. Over the past year across Canada, innovation has helped to keep our food supply and our economy strong, despite the incredible, incredible challenges of the pandemic. Last year, our agriculture and food exports hit a new record of almost 74 billion, putting us well on our way to beating our government's target of 75 billion by 2025. Net farm income and grain production also hit record highs last year. And our food and beverage processing industry moved ahead of transportation equipment to post the highest sales of any manufacturing sector in Canada, almost $123 billion. It is also the country's largest manufacturing employer with more than 280,000 employees in 2020. Innovation has always been the lifeblood of agriculture across Canada, including in my riding in, my riding in rural Eastern Ontario, which home, is home to many innovative farms and food beverage businesses. From livestock genetics to plant science, to precision agriculture, Canada is a global leader in agri-food innovation. We are a top five agri-food agri exporter and a pioneer in sustainable agriculture systems, such as zero tillage. Advances in automation and artificial intelligence are boosting sustainable production and long-term competitiveness. And innovation is vital to helping the sector address labor-related challenges, including those highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our government shares your passion for agriculture innovation as a driver of the sector. Our recent federal budget proposes a new investment of $2 billion under the Strategic Infrastructure Innovation Fund to support innovative projects across the economy, including the agriculture sector. There's also $400 million for Genome Canada to build on its great work in plant breeding research. Funding has already helped AAFC scientists in their work to improve yields and disease resistance in a wide range of crops from wheat to grapes to sunflowers. On sustainability research, the budget proposes an extra 200 million for our 10-year agriculture climate solution program, which drive on-farm research to help farmers take immediate action on the environment. ACS uses the Living Lab model, which is bringing farmers and researchers together across Canada to develop and test practices and technologies that help the farmers protect the environment and grow the business. On Monday, Minister Bibeau launched the Ontario Living Lab Initiative to take place in the Lake Erie Basin in Southern Ontario. Backed by a federal investment of just over 4.2 million, farmers and researchers will work together to strengthen soil health, improve water quality, and lessen the impacts of farming on lakes and other water resources. We've also added 165 million to our Agriculture Clean Technologies Program, which supports research and clean agriculture technologies that have a real impact on carbon emissions. Technologies such as biodigesters, which are used on a growing number of livestock farms 
across the country. Farms such as Harcum Farms, a dairy operation in Western Ontario, which the minister visited last year, their digester system turns dairy manure into biogas that is sold back into the grid. Meanwhile, byproducts are used for animal bedding and crop fertilizer. This is an example of a farmer who is willing to take some risks to demonstrate new clean technology for other farms to see and learn from it. And best of all, the technology reduced the farmer's greenhouse gas emissions from 150 tonne a year to 50. These are the kinds of clean technologies that our government wants to support. As the minister is fond of saying, ecology and economy can go together. Budget 2021 also pro proposes an extra 60 million for the supercluster super initiative, which will help the superclusters continue their great work. Over 153 million investment in the Protein Industries Canada, Supercluster is bringing together the best and brightest to capture the incredible opportunities in the plant protein sector. We offered nearly 100 million in financial, financing support to the Merit Functional Foods Plan in Winnipeg, which recently began the world's first commercial production of canola protein suitable for human consu consumption. And budget 2021 will also step up our efforts to get high-speed internet to rural Canada. As you know, agriculture today is incredibly advanced. Farmers are using tools such as GPS, satellite imagery, automation drones, and other digital technologies to practice precision agriculture. These tools allow them to boost production and farm more sustainably by targeting chemicals and fertilizer right down to the square meter. But to get maximum benefit from these technologies, our farmers and agribusinesses need to access the best connectivity. That's why our government is investing 1.75 billion to connect virtually all households in Canada to high-speed internet over the next five years. And that includes rural Canada. On your budget 2021, there's an extra 1 billion over six years to help ensure we meet our target. Looking ahead, innovation will be front and center as we begin to look ahead to the next policy framework that will be launched in the two years time. Over the coming months, our governments will reach out to a broad group of stakeholders to seek their ideas on concurrent programming under Canadian Agriculture Partnership, as well as future direction for the next framework. In the meantime, our scientists and industry continue to partner under our agri-science research clusters. Our federal government, of investment of 180 million in our 19 research clusters across a wide range of sectors has leveraged over 100 million for industry to drive cutting edge agriculture innovations, such as livestock feed that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, light technology to boost the safety of frozen vegetables and green building materials made from biomass. There's also exciting work on, on through the national automation cluster under the leadership of your vice president, Tanya Humphrey at the Vine Line Research and Innovation Center. Projects include an automated mushroom harvesting system, an autonomous cucumber harvester for greenhouse producers, and a smart irrigation system for potted greenhouse flowers that help growers save on labor and water costs. Another example of the vital role of innovation is food waste reduction. Every year, over half of the food produced in Canada is wasted from farm to plate through production, processing, distribution, retail food services, and at home. This is a major social and environmental program that we're turning to innovation to solve it. For example, our government is supporting the work of Entrecorp in Western Canada to produce pet food and fertilizer, fertilizer from black soldier flies. The feedstock is surplus fruits, vegetables, and other from local farmers, grocery stores, and food processors. To foster this kind of innovation last year, we launched a $20 million food waste reduction challenge, offering cash prizes to innovators with solutions to prevent or divert food waste at any point of the food supply chain from farm to plate. The response was amazing. We received well over 300 proposals from across Canada and around the world. Just last week, we announced the 24 finalists who will move on to test their solutions over the coming year and a new round starts up in a year's time. Like you, our government understands that access to capital and entrepreneurial mentorship are key to getting ideas to the marketplace. With respect to private investment, Canada is actually one of the top performers for ag tech venture capital investment in the world. In fact, according to the US-based venture capital fund, AG Funder, Canada attracted more than a half a billion dollars in venture capital funding towards innovative agriculture and food technologies in 2020. Our growing agriculture and food technology ecosystems already include 160 startups, multinational agri-input companies, major tech telecommunication providers, and leading venture investors. As well as Canada's growing agriculture, food, and technology ecosystems, includes an increasing number of technology accelerators and venture investors. Winnipeg-based Farmer's Edge started as an innovative startup in 20, 2005 and recently raised over $125 million through an initial public offering 
on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's great to see they are partnering with Protein Industry Canada on building flow, flow grain traceability from field to market, as well creative destruction labs based in Ontario and Alberta launched a dedicated agricultural stream in 2020. And in January, SBG Ventures held an inaugural Thrive Canada Challenge in partnership with Farm Credit Canada. Over 100 companies pitched their ideas with top nine presenting their innovations to investors from around the world. Interest from these new players and others in opening new avenues of investment with a diverse network of corporate partners and investors. Palace has recognized agriculture food technology as a significant growth opportunity and launched a business line that includes a suite of digital solutions for agri-food supply chains. Looking ahead, I'm optimistic about the future of the great sector. Beyond food technologies are opening up exciting new sales avenues, like turning hemp stock and other farm waste into combustible coffee pods, combustible, uh, green construction material, and even car parts and jet fuel. Farm exports and incomes are at record levels. Last year, Canadian agriculture was the nation's top economic performer. Across the Canada, including in the far north, incredible things are happening to capture the economic opportunities and food security that come with a vibrant and innovative food production system. Advanced technologies are helping Canada become a global leader in sustainability. And while we act, we want to act fast, we must act smart. Minister Bibo and our government will continue to work with you to help the sector emerge from the pandemic stronger, more innovative, and more resilient than ever. Once again, thank you for your vision and all the best in your upcoming summit. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, uh, Mr. Ellis, and for this uh, uh, comprehensive uh, overview. Thank you. I would like to uh, now uh, briefly introduce our guest speakers uh, for today. Uh, Amy Argentino. Amy is uh, the manager of projects and programs at the Canadian uh, Horticultural uh, Council, and she's also responsible for the management of the Canadian Horticultural uh, Research uh, Cluster. Next, we have uh, Julian uh, Kern. Julianne is uh, the Vice President of Market Innovation at uh, Pulse Canada, where uh, she leads uh, the development and implementation of marketing strategies to diversify markets for the Canadian pea, lentil, bean, and chickpea industry. Julianne also serves as uh, the chair uh, of uh, AIC's uh, board of directors. Gart Patterson. Uh, Gart is the executive director at Western Grains uh, Research Foundation. And for more than 35 years, Gart has been involved in leadership roles in marketing, research, international development, and communications. Prior to joining the foundation in 2011, Gart was uh, executive director of the Saskatchewan uh, Pulse Growers. And last but not least, Carolyn uh, Patterson. Carolyn is uh, the principal at uh, Pathfinders Research and Management Limited. She currently works with uh, Agwes Bio, managing the diverse uh, field crops uh, cluster. Caroline has uh, extensive experience in the research, regulatory, production, and quality assurance uh, environments for agri-food uh, pro uh, products. So thank you all uh, for, for joining us. Each of our panelists uh, will have up to 15 minutes to give their presentation. And after their presentation, we'll take uh, questions uh, from the audience. We'll begin with uh, Amy. Amy, please go ahead. Okay, let's hope I can share my screen. <laughs> having some technical difficulties beforehand, which of course always happen when you're presenting. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, just a second here. Hmm. Amy, it's good, it's, it's on the screen. Okay, just a moment though. I was hoping to be able to read my notes at the same time on screen, so. I might have to adjust my setup a little bit just for myself. So uh, just a moment. Uh, okay, is that working? Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, as uh, Carl introduced me, I am Amy Argentino. I'm the manager of projects and programs at the Canadian Horticultural Council. And I've been managing the uh, agri-science cluster for horticulture since the beginning of the clusters program. So we have quite a, quite a long history with this program and it's been quite uh, beneficial over time for, uh, for the horticulture sector. So I'll just give you a bit of an overview on the cluster uh, for horticulture. It's an investment of nearly $21 million with 13 million from AAFC, bringing together expertise from academia, industry and government to address key challenges in the hort sector. And we've broken up our projects into five commodity groups for berry, vegetable, greenhouse, apple, and potato. So it's uh, 
the, we have 16 projects total and stretched out over, over the five commodity groups. We have 59 researchers and 32 institutions collaborating on these projects and over 70 industry contributors investing nearly $8 million. We're one of those groups that do not have a checkoff. So we have quite a few that are contributing to these projects. Uh, it's been quite a, quite a collaborative effort. Uh, these priorities that we have addressed through our cluster are pest management, uh, production and post-harvest practices, variety evaluation, and labor efficiencies. This is a list of some of our projects. I've got two slides for this. Um, we've got quite a diverse uh, group of projects um, led by both AFC and um, university researchers. Most of our potato projects are um, are led by a Canada researchers. So we have quite, quite a bit going on and quite a few collaborators across the country. Looking ahead to 2025, uh, we are going to be looking at a few activities just in preparation for cluster four and just in general. Um, we'll be conducting an online survey of our cluster three participants to collect their comments and just suggestions on the cluster experience. We've done this in the past with our previous clusters and received some really productive feedback. So we're hoping to do that again in the very short term. We will also be reviewing our innovation priorities for the cluster, of course, keeping with the five-year framework, working, looking to 2023 to 2028. We, again, like most clusters have done this in the past, we will be doing this again as our prep for that. We also are going to be taking a look at some future research funding opportunities with other Government of Canada departments. We know that a lot of the priorities have some have focused towards climate change, and there are probably some other opportunities. We've seen really good success with the clusters, and we want to keep building on that with research. Uh, CHD as an organization is also looking to assess the impacts of the pandemic, what challenges were faced by growers. And as a result, are there things that we should be doing differently? Should we focus on specific research as a result of that? Which, how does the future look for horticulture? Just quickly, this is our timeline for planning for cluster four. We are starting with a review of our innovation and strategy documents. We're following a similar process to our last application prep, prep aiming for an application to be completed in January of 2023. Of course, if AAFC changes the timeline, which I think we all have our fingers crossed for, that we would like to see the, the program roll out a little bit sooner, then we would adapt to that. But uh, hopefully, it, no matter what, it, is, it leads to starting projects on April 1st of 2023. I know Reynolds mentioned that on Wednesday, that seeing that, that, that hard start date would be really great. So hopefully, we will Fingers crossed that that, is, that may be a reality, although it's been a bit of a challenge in the past. So looking at key priorities, uh, as I mentioned, we haven't yet completed our priority setting exercise, but I see a few areas that we could be addressing and, of course, focusing on grower needs and benefits. I think our top area would be around labor efficiencies. The labor gap in horticulture is becoming a real crisis. It's expected to increase to 46,500 jobs by 2025, and it's the largest labor gap in ag the agricultural sector. The seasonal and labor intensive nature of many growing operations means that horticulture relies heavily on international workers than do other segments of agricultural production. It's 43% of hort workers coming from outside of Canada compared to 17% for the rest of agriculture and 61% of horticulture farmers hire foreign workers compared to 35% of the rest of agriculture. And related to that, of course, COVID really presented challenges around this with travel restrictions, social distancing, PPE costs. There's been quite a, quite a few things as a result um, and just the pandemic itself and, and you know, people being sick has become a real, a real challenge for, for horticulture growers. So one thing I think that we could be doing to address some of that is around automation. I know Tanya mentioned this in her presentation on Wednesday, talking about the work that Vineland has been doing and horticulture 
does need innovation in this area. And I think that we will see an increase in this priority for research in the future. Uh, another area that I think we'll be focusing on a bit is sustainability. Canada has been fortunate that the worst case scenarios for our food supply weren't realized during the pandemic, but a renewed focus on the food supply chain is an opportunity to better understand our role uh, that the food system plays in healthy economy and healthy, healthy population. Um, the Canadian fruit and vegetable sector has taken the lead on promoting environmental sustainability by adopting some sustainable practices. Um, some of, an example of this would be some of the transitions and work towards looking at possibly having um, better recyclable and compostable egg plastics, farm plastics and fruit and vegetable packaging materials. So I think that we're gonna see some, maybe some research and innovation in this area as well. Climate change is also part of this. We know that horticulture can be a solutions provider and it's a big area, but I think there's you know, a number of things that we can, that we can work on to address this. Uh, the third one, of course, is not a new priority by any means, but pest management tools. Uh, growers have been focused on better control practices for pests for quite a number of years. Crop protection tool, tools such as pesticides, biopesticides, beneficial organisms, they're all essential to fresh produce industry and to encourage the overall health of crops and keeping in mind this, of course, the safety of Canadians and the overall food security. So this is definitely an area that we'll continue to focus on as it continues to be a pretty, pretty high priority for growers. So looking forward, how can we collaborate? We're looking to explore some partnerships across the country and across commodities. For example, we know that labor efficiency solutions have potential to help many different areas within horticulture. We all have those challenges, growers, whether you're apples or zucchinis or potatoes, anything in between, everyone has, you know, it's very labor intensive to grow food in Canada, especially for fruits and vegetables. So we know that this is something that we can kind of look at partnerships uh, across the country and across commodity. We're also kind of looking at what areas along the supply chain we could be collaborating with. We've worked a lot with growers and processors on some of our projects, specifically with on potatoes, but we know that there are others that we could be partnering with, whether it's input providers, it's um, you know, farm equipment, packers, retailers. We are kind of looking along the chain to, to see how we can collaborate better on some things. Uh, we are also open to suggestions and ideas for future cluster activities. So if anyone participating on these on these seminars, webinars have seen something that we could maybe focus on together, we would be more than willing to uh, to explore some opportunities where we have been sort of focused in certain areas, but I do see the need to expand and to kind of broaden horizons as to what innovation could be for horticulture. So that's, I am keeping it very short and sweet today. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present and for any more information on our cluster, please visit our website or just feel free to contact me at any time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Amy. Definitely your, uh, your last point about collaborating uh, across uh, country, across uh, commodities and along supply chains as a way to, to broaden your horizon. I, I think this is uh, definitely a key point to, to keep in mind across uh, uh, across the sector as a whole. So thank you for your uh, presentation. Thanks. I will um, I will now ask uh, Julianne to please uh, go ahead. Thank you. How's that? You're seeing my presentation. Yes, thank you. Great, okay. So as, as Carl mentioned, I'm Julianne Curran. I'm the VP of Market Innovation at Pulse Canada and also uh, currently serving as the chair of AIC. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to present on what the Canadian pulse industry is looking ahead to for 2025. Just by way of background, the pulse science cluster is really driven by our member associations uh, who come together under Pulse Canada's national umbrella. So it's really our provincial pulse producer associations who are making significant investments into R&D. But as the national association, Pulse Canada acts on behalf of our members for issues of national importance. 
So this includes challenges with trade, market access, but also market diversification. With the majority of Canadian pulses being exported to international markets and a small number of large markets, there's uncertainty about the long-term stability um, of those markets. And for that reason, diversification has become extremely important for our sector. With that in mind, our industry has set a target for market diversification, our 25 by 2025 target, which translates into looking to see 25% of Canadian pulses going into non-traditional markets by 2025, which is roughly 2 million tons of pulses. So this target was set uh, by the Pulse Canada Board in 2018, and our strategy for market diversification uh, to meet these targets was developed after the current pulse science cluster was already up and running. Um, so I'm gonna talk more about this strategy because it really relates to our vision to 2025, but just wanna stress that um, this strategy for diversification is a collaboration between Pulse Canada and our member associations. And we really want to more closely align the next pulse science cluster with this 25 by 2025 strategy. So we have developed crop specific volume targets based on production levels here in Canada and also the most relevant processing streams and regions, um, categories with the greatest volume potential for, for usage of these crops. And a major focus of the strategy is on marketing activities, but research is also very critical to underpin and address the challenges that we need to overcome in achieving these volume targets. With respect to the 25 by 2025 strategy uh, for diversification, these are the areas of research we feel are really important um, to build demand and support that diversified growth for our sector. So the first steam, stream is research that addresses broad industry challenges, whether those are technical, regulatory, or marketing challenges. The second stream is the need to build data on quality and performance of Canadian pulses, as well as uh, just pulse ingredients as a category. Um, and thirdly, to demonstrate alignment of pulses with global nutrition, health, and sustainability goals. What I'll do for the remainder of my talk is just to highlight some examples of projects under each of these research streams um, to show how innovation and collaboration are key to addressing the priorities. I'm gonna start with the first stream of addressing industry challenges. So with respect to research to address industry challenges, the first example I'll highlight is a technical challenge we face for meeting our volume target for pulse flower use in particular. So this figure shows the volume of pulse flower used in the US in 2020. Dog food was the highest category for volume use at just over 70,000 tons. Um, whereas food applications such as pasta, snacks, and baked goods use a relatively volume of, of pulse flowers. In fact, under 2% of the uh, flower used in those categories is from pulses. So there really is a lot of room to grow there. And one of the challenges or the constraints um, facing pea and lentil flowers in particular is flavor and functionality issues that they have that really limits their inclusion in these food applications without impacting product quality. This is an example of a project we did last year to help address this challenge for the sector. The project explored non-traditional milling strategies to produce flower streams that had quite a range of protein content, starch damage, and particle size. And this figure shows how the different flower streams that we produced from pea and lentils with these different milling methods, um, how they performed in noodles. Um, and so you can see that there was very different performance of the flowers um, in terms of these different noodle um, parameters. Um, particularly, you can see a lot of changes um, you know, in noodle taste, depending on, on the flower milling and um, uh, the, the, the flower quality that was used. So now this is a, um, a, a toolbox um, for industry, the data here, so they can actually optimize, use this to optimize their flower ingredients if they're looking for particular um, properties for uh, relevant food applications. Oops. 
Another challenge facing the, the pulse industry and, and other sectors as well is the ability to make claims about protein in marketing and labeling um, based on current regulations. Um, because in both Canada and the US, these claims aren't just based on the protein content, but also the protein quality. So it puts many plant-based um, protein ingredients at a disadvantage and they have difficulty making these claims. So this is an example here where we collaborated with industry um, to conduct some research that would help to address this regulatory issue. So we partnered with Loblaws, the Hederley Foundation, and the Universities of Toronto and Manitoba on a project that would encourage regulatory modernization for protein claims. What the project did was assess the risk to Canadians of consuming more plant-based protein and the impact of this on their um, quality of diet. We've also initiated a similar project in the US in collaboration with General Mills. And I don't wanna get into the data, but just to show um, these are, are what the results look like where protein intakes and diet quality were determined at four different levels of plant protein consumption. So this study has uh, just recently been published if you wanted to look at it further. Another fa challenge facing our industry is the need for more high value usage for all the pea starch that's generated through protein fractionation. And this is a common challenge um, among the industry stakeholders. So a recent study that we commissioned from Euromonitor showed that right now the majority of pea starch is going into ethanol and animal feed, whereas only a small percent of uh, pea starch is used in higher value industrial uses and um, food and sport uh, nutrition products. For this particular challenge of increasing use of pulse starch, innovation and collaboration with the research community is really needed. So most of the starch is used in categories where it doesn't have a unique functionality um, and can easily be substituted, as you can see, in that sort of bottom um, square, the small square. So to get more usage in categories like food, bioplastics, paper, and packaging, we need to really explore more modifications to starch, um, as well as innovation for specialized uses like sweeteners and pharmaceuticals. With Canada having such a high production of peas, I think this is an opportunity for us to really take a, a leadership role here, um, similar to what's been seen in the US for corn historically. I've talked about some examples of addressing industry challenges. Now I'm just gonna move into the second stream on the need to build data on the quality and performance of Canadian pulses and their ingredient de derivatives. One of the challenges facing the industry on this front is as it becomes more and more competitive um, for, for pulses in the, in the plant protein uh, space, um, it's really challenging for end users to navigate um, how different ingredients perform because there are so many different products in the marketplace that range in terms of um, quality and functionality. So to address this um, and help companies to better position themselves and distinguish how their ingredients perform relative to the competition, we're working right now on getting a project going in collaboration with the NRC and the University of Saskatchewan. This project will also bring in industry collaborators by using um, their commercial samples to build public data um, on the functionality and performance of pulse ingredients relative to each other and to soy protein. Um, which is really needed by end users. So companies would remain anonymous, but the data can be used to help companies distinguish where their projects fit or where their products fit within the range. As part of our strategy, we wanna make sure Canadian pulses have preferred quality for processing. And for peas, this is for fractionation in particular. So we're collaborating with our member associations right now using samples from their regional variety trials to test the quality attributes of peas that are well relevant for processing. So this is just some uh, data here showing the variability in iron content. And I, I'm just wanting to show this particular attribute because it's relevant actually in meat analogs. Um, when there's a slight drop in iron content in the ingredients, it re can require um, the food product to actually be fortified with iron. So it's important to, to get these iron levels at the right um, amount to avoid that. Another differentiator for Canadian pulses is our sustainability story. So we wanna ensure we have robust sustainability data that accounts for all aspects of production, 
regional variability, and a range of environmental metrics. This allows us to provide the best data possible to those who are sourcing from Canada. Here's some of the recent data we developed for P, and we have the same data for Lanto and are currently building this for beans and faba beans. So the last area I'll cover is the need for research that demonstrates the alignment of pulses with global health, nutrition, and sustainability goals. Results from a 2020 study by the International Food Information Council showed that after taste and price, health and sustainability are significant drivers for consumers. So if we're gonna build demand and increase consumption of pulses and all agri-food commodities for that matter, we really need to demonstrate the alignment um, with these broader goals that um, are goals of consumers and society at large. To further illustrate this point, um, these are just results from that protein intake study that I uh, referenced earlier that we did with Loblaws and the other partners. And you can see that across um, the different uh, quartiles of pulse protein consumption, um, going from uh, quartile one where protein consumption from plants was only up to 25% all the way across to uh, quartile four where consumers were consuming 75% or more of their protein from plant-based sources. Consumption of, of pulses is actually quite low and the majority of plant protein, um, especially in those high uh, quartiles of plant protein intake is actually coming from breads, rolls, crackers, and grains. So there's a really great opportunity here for collaboration and partnerships um, to improve the quality of our diets and our food supply from both a nutrition and environmental perspective and work together to um, address some of these consumer drivers. I'll just give you a few examples of this um, from some projects that we've done in the last couple of years as well. So these are results from a study we published in 2018, where we tested the nutrition and sustainability impact of reformulating breads, cereals, and pastas with either pea flour, which is on the left, or lentil flour, which is on the right. So the data shown here is on the nutrient balance score, which accounts for any increase in positive nutrients and a decrease in negative nutrients. And as you can see, the reformulated products with peas that are shown in yellow and the lentils that are shown in brown all had improved nutrient balance scores compared to the traditional products shown in the gray bars. Another project we did um, here looked at the nutritional improvements for a beef lentil blended burger. So we saw reductions in fat and cholesterol and increases in fiber and folate. In addition to the nutritional benefits in that example, we also calculated the environmental benefits of product reformulations. And so in the case of the blended burger, we saw a 33% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, water use and land use when um, the burger was reformulated. One last example here is inclusion of peas in animal feed. So this is a project we just recently completed and by including peas in swine feed or layer hen feed, we saw reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions. So, in conclusions, and just to wrap up, I've presented here just um, some examples of how we've been using innovation to address some of our priorities of um, industry issues, building data on Canadian pulse quality, and also demonstrating alignment of pulses with global nutrition, health, and sustainability goals. We feel that in order to achieve our 25 by 2025 targets, these are the key priorities and also see a lot of opportunity for collaboration um, and more collaboration between producers and processors and manufacturers in particular, because um, this is all the kind of work that has broad benefit for the category in this sector. So thank you. Stop thank you very sharing. much. Uh... Julianne, a very interesting presentation at the risk of repeating uh, what you said. And as you pointed out, research and innovations are a critical means to, to achieve volume target ends uh, in, in this case, and takes a variety of forms, whether it's addressing uh, industry challenges, building data, or demonst demonstrating uh, alignment of pulses with broader goals, including, uh, but not limited to uh, some of the examples you pointed out with uh, nutrition. So thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Before we move on to our third presentation, I would just like to remind our uh, participants to feel free to use the Q&A button that's located at the bottom of the screen. We'll uh, take your questions and um, pause them to our speakers uh, at the end of uh, our last presentation. So our next speaker is uh, Gart Patterson. Gart, please uh, go ahead. Uh, 
Kurt. Uh, you're, oh, there we go. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where, where you are in Canada right now. Uh, thanks very much to AIC for the invitation of this. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you a bit about WGRF. Uh, uh, Julianne, that was a great presentation, tough act to follow here. So I'll see if I can keep up to that high standard that you set. But, uh, first of all, I will tell you a bit about uh, WGRF and who we are, for those of you that aren't familiar with us. And of course, I will talk about uh, the specific cluster that we're leading and uh, finish off by looking forward uh, and what we see the future looking like for from our perspective here right now. So I'm just uh, working on the advance. When we tested this earlier, the advanced screen was working. So there we go. Uh, first of all, uh, just a little bit about WGRF, our vision and mission. Uh, we are a bit unique as an organization. Uh, our vision is uh, focuses on the profitability and sustainability of Western Canadian grain farmers, and our, our mission is to direct investments into crop research to benefit those farmers. A uh, little bit about us, we actually are a, a federally registered not-for-profit and we do have charitable status. Uh, we have a board of directors of 18 farmers all the way from uh, northern BC to uh, southern Manitoba, covering the prairies in between. Uh, we have, there's 18 farm organizations that are members of WGRF and each nominates a farmer to be elected to the board. Uh, our focus is quite targeted compared to some of the other uh, organizations that have uh, been involved in the summit. Uh, we focus on funding research. Uh, there's, uh, we understand that there's uh, many, many other areas that are important in, in uh, growing uh, the GDP for agriculture and that are important to the ag industry in Canada. We've uh, chosen uh, through our membership to take a very targeted focus and look at research funding. Uh, on average, over the last five years, we invest about $15 million a year ourselves into research funding. Uh, most of it is uh, through partnerships, and I'll explain that. Uh, we're currently invested in 172 projects in 15 different crops and involved in five clusters, which I'll mention a little more later. Uh, we also are involved in some capacity funding, and uh, right now, with our current commitments, we're looking at about $53 million in research funding over the next four years. Just a, a list of the crops, I won't read them off, and I think this presentation is will be available to you. If not, I can certainly please to share it for any that want to reach out directly. But there are 15 different crops that uh, we have an interest in and we look at when we're funding research, and we'll look at either single crop issues or uh, multi-crop cross-cutting related issues. I'll mention a little more about the cross-cutting aspect when we get into the integrated crop agronomy cluster. Uh, the two areas that we look at generally uh, for research funding uh, are in the areas of variety development and production. And there's some examples of the types of research that uh, we will consider when we look at proposals that are listed here. It's not meant to be all inclusive, but just to give you an idea, the types of research that we have an interest in. Uh, the process that we use is we participate in established science-based competitive processes that uh, offer opportunities for us to advance research in our areas of, of interest. And uh, I, there's many, many of you I, I see from the participant list that are partners of ours. Uh, we, we work with uh, Western, with the pro provincially based processes in Western Canada. We've, uh, of course, are involved with the Canadian Ag Partnership through clusters and projects. We've been involved in Genome Canada, or we currently are, as, as well as uh, NSERC. And we're always uh, looking for other opportunities to partner in processes that we have an interest in. Uh, we have taken some uh, additional initiatives. Uh, outside of those competitive processes to advance capacity in Western Canada. Uh, phase one and two of our accelerating capacity initiative. Uh, phase one is on the screen now where we actually have uh, made long-term funding commitments to 
research chairs in uh, the three primary Western Canadian universities that are involved in agriculture research. Uh, those are listed here on the screen. Uh, the second phase, which was a competitive uh, open call, uh, we launched in 2019. And last year, uh, the board approved $24 million worth of uh, funding in this program to expand research capacity. We've started making announcements over the last year through COVID, throughout COVID and we'll continue to do that as some of the larger projects are, uh, are come into place. Another part of what is important to us for capacity is building capacity. We provide $300,000 a year in graduate student scholarships to each of the again, three Western Canadian agriculture focused universities in uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And uh, we've been involved in that for a number of years and recently significantly increased this to $100,000 per year per university. And we've, uh, we're starting to see those scientists now uh, finish their research and get involved uh, you know, in the industry, which is uh, a real pleasure uh, for us to see that coming to fruition. We are involved in knowledge transfer. Uh, we don't run a large uh, internal program ourselves. We look for ways to partner with programs. This is just one example of our KTT, and we were the founding sponsor of the Canadian Agronomist, which is a, uh, an initiative to actually uh, translate and boil down research, target both uh, professionals agrologists that are working with farmers and farmers themselves on specific issues. Uh, now mo moving a little more specifically to the test today with respect to the current clusters. Uh, uh, I guess myself, I've been involved. Uh, this will be the third round of clusters I, I've been involved with and uh, I've certainly seen the evolution over the years. Uh, Currently at WGRF, we're involved in five different clusters. And I think throughout the summit, all of those clusters uh, you will be making presentations here. So it's not my intent to discuss all of those, but the one specifically we've been asked to speak about today is the integrated crop agronomy cluster that we're leading. Um, this is a new cluster uh, under, under CAP. So we we're very pleased to have uh, be part of 11 industry partners uh, along with AAFC to develop this cluster. Uh, it's a $9 million cluster over five years. And it really uh, was intended to look at cross cutting issues and to complement some of the more uh, crop specific uh, clusters that uh, we are all also involved in. Uh, there are the, the three key themes that we're involved in here in this cluster are uh, sustainable cropping systems, uh, resiliency to climate change and uh, technology transfer. I'll have a little more to say about those. Um, these are the partners. I won't uh, I won't read all this out, but their logos are on the screen here, and we're uh, really pleased to be uh, working with all of these partners. And it's certainly, uh, uh, if uh, you know, looking forward. Uh, if our interests and priorities align with uh, the new new programs that we hope to see out of agriculture and agri-food Canada, we'll certainly be looking at uh, another integrated crop agronomy cluster and uh, how it will fit. Okay, there, just lost my ability to advance for a second there. Uh, so a bit more to say about these, uh, about the integrated crop agronomy cluster itself. Uh, there's uh, eight different projects associated with this cluster. Um, those include the monitoring of field crop insect pests uh, with through an insect monitoring program, uh, includes uh, identifying and responding to new invasive pests and uh, all technologies and tools for monitoring, tracking and forecasting populations of insect pests. Uh, also highlighting the role of natural enemies to field crop pests and the technology and transfer uh, communication tools for this. Uh, another project here is crop a crop disease monitoring network in the prairies, including serial disease surveys, 
forecasting of movement of serial rust spores, uh, mapping capacity for disease surveillance, and uh, collaborating with uh, and training trainers to, to uh, improve their knowledge in this area. Another project is crop sequencing and developing a risk model to mitigate uh, FHB in Western Canadian cereal production. So it includes crop sequencing research as well as the development of, of models to assess the risk of FHB infection and as well uh, an interactive prairie-wide uh, risk map. And another project is the uh, management of glyphosate resistant kochia in Western Canadian cropping systems. Herbicide uh, resistant weeds have be certainly becoming more of an issue in crop production in Western Canada. Um, this research looks at crop diversity and crop life cycle on the management of the glyphosate resistant kochia, uh, as well as integrated cultural methods and uh, measuring the seed production potential of glyphosate resistant kochia. Uh, another project is spray drift management, uh, including fluid modeling of fluid dynamics to simulate spray drift. And any of you that have seen this presentation at some of the winter workshops pre-COVID would be, uh, there is quite a, uh, a ver some very good modeling that uh, presents well to farmers on, uh, in this area. Um, also, this looks at quantifying pesticide drift from high clearance self-propelled sprayers and uh, the physiological responses of crops to simulated herbicide drift. Uh, the, and the final two uh, relate to cropping systems productivity and resilience and sustainability in the major Canadian ecozone. So this is a, a very large uh, integrated project. I, I'm not mentioning the researchers and the institutions and in all of these because I'll certainly miss some, but there's great multi-institutional collaboration here in these. Um, the final one is a performance of emerging cropping systems in non-traditional areas. And this is primary looking, primarily looking at corn and soybean in non-traditional areas and uh, the performance of economic ag and agronomic performance of them in these non-traditional areas. We, we do have a KTT component. Um, this is just an example under uh, the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network uh, that's been established uh, a number of years ago. It's a very uh, successful and collaborative uh, initiative, multi-institutional, multi, -institutional, multi uh, uh, a, a number of different players across the prairies. And the, this, uh, this website continues to advance and uh, show up-to-date information and make it available to anyone who wants to go to it. Uh, now, looking forward, I mentioned earlier, we're looking at right now ourselves about $53 million at this point in research funding over the next four years. We do expect it'll increase as uh, more as more approvals are made by our board and We'll continue looking in these uh, four areas that I would call project funding, program funding, infrastructure funding, and hopefully new cluster funding as opportunities present itself. And uh, of course, a new opportunity right now that uh, the parliamentary secretary mentioned with respect to ag climate solutions. Uh, we're certainly interested in partnering with others in that area. Also, uh, what we've done to uh, start mapping our future and certainly inform us with respect to the integrated crop agronomy cluster and other other funding investments we'll make is uh, we've started out uh, I guess step one of this process was to engage uh, some consultants that uh, their one of their COVID projects was to survey a number of stakeholders in Western Canada through this past winter uh, scientists industry uh, as well as farmers and other stakeholders. There was 187 of them. Um, it's called the Amathon Report. It is on our website. Uh, we, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, we're gonna be doing uh, additional consultations through the summer and fall. Uh, when those switch from virtual to in-person, I guess uh, will remain to be seen, but we certainly hope to finish up with uh, in-person discussions in the fall. But uh, we're really looking uh, for some uh, additional information and guidance to assist the WGF board and 
uh, mapping the future for us and looking at what's most important to farmers. Uh, what what uh, I guess some of the key points that were heard uh, from this report uh, over the winter, I'll just mention now, but I'd encourage you, as I said, to go take a look at it. But what the respondents generally thought is that we would, farms would continue to grow larger in Western Canada. So we're talking grain farms, that's our interest. And uh, that cereals, canola and pulses would continue to be the major acreage crops on those farms. Um, there was certainly diversity in views about what some of the uh, minor acreage crops would be also in those areas. Uh, crop and soil management issues uh, were very important and there's a number of uh, research, uh, I think issues that will be identified out of that. Uh, sustainability is very important and uh, precision ag uh, is viewed as becoming more and more important moving forward and uh, that tool will become more common. So I think that helps inform us uh, moving forward here. Uh, but certainly, as I said, uh, we're gonna be putting some more effort into looking into that. Uh, with that, Carl, I'll, I'll just say thank you and I'm certainly available for questions or discussion uh, at the end here. Thanks very much, uh, Bert. Uh, I know your point that uh, you've seen the evolution of the cluster program uh, over the years. And this is uh, your third one, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I'll, I'll be uh, curious to, uh, to ask you and uh, the other panelists uh, a question on that uh, during the, the Q&A period. So thanks very much for, uh, for your presentation, uh, Gert. Last but not least, before we move to our uh, Q&A period, I'll uh, invite uh, Caroline to uh, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, yeah. I'm hoping this works. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think I have to share my screen first and then open up my presentation and it'll show up. So please bear with me. Um, yeah, so we'll just go from here. Share, yeah, okay. And sharing that one. Okay. Okay, is it sharing okay. at all? Not quite, no. Not quite, eh? Oh boy. Because this is, okay, we'll do it this way. Share. Okay, is it sharing now? So we'll just do it this way. Oh, we, we see it, it's, oh, there we go. This one, the full screen or, or with the uh, advanced? Uh, with the advanced slide as well. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Okay. So I'll just have to work on it from this way and then and then just go. I don't know why it's not uh, allowing me to do this, but anyway. So just going to back up. I'm going to just say first thank you uh, for inviting um, Diverse Field Crop Cluster to come and uh, discuss uh, exactly what we're doing. We're a very unique cluster. It's led and administered by AgWest Bio, which is housed in Saskatoon, and it represents uh, probably seven different crops um, across Western Canada and um, into Eastern Canada as well. So we've got flax, camelina, canary seed, sunflower, hemp, quinoa, and mustard. And these are basically considered to be small acreage crops um, across Western Canada particularly, but they do play an important role in diversifying Western Canadian agriculture, uh, particularly when, you know, intercrop between um, the, um, not intercrop, but used as uh, in crop rotation with the big three canola, pulses, and wheat. So what we have got is each one of these seven different crops is actually, you know, we've got seven different crop sector members in Saskatchewan and across Western Canada and across Canada, primarily Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance represents hemp. Norquin is a private company that represents um, quinoa. Manitoba Crop Alliance uh, represents um, uh, sunflower. Mustard 21 represents actually three different varieties of mustard, the browns, the yellows, the Oriental and also Carinata. Smart Earth represents Camelina. Canary Seed represents the Canary Seed component of the projects. And Sass Flax uh, represents flax. What is interesting is DFCC goals, you know, we primarily uh, began the cluster to strengthen productivity and increase profitability for farmers across Canada. 
there's a real issue of disease and pests. And so we wanted to address some of those issues within the cluster. And also these particular crops, even though they're small acreage, they do have unique opportunities for food, feed and industrial applications. So, you know, DFCC itself is a $24 million investment, 13 million by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, 11 million by industry. It has 16 different activities eight variety development, four in agronomy and uh, crop protection, and four in value add. But from a funding perspective, variety development basically takes up the biggest chunk of funding within the cluster itself. And, it, and it's a really crucial element because we're looking at small acreage crops that really don't have the financial resources behind them to really develop and you know, optimize crops for the Canadian environment. I'm just going to talk a little bit about our three themes. Variety development is, is like I said, is, is the most important one with amongst the group. And it basically is comprised of both upstream and downstream um, uh, activities. You know, we've got laboratory based um, activities only you know, looking at development of molecular tools and breeding platforms right down to um, the field trials that individual groups are doing and, and showing the importance of developing those agronomic practices and getting yield data that you can be passed back down to the farmer. What I really want to highlight, though, is some of the successes that we've seen already within within the DFCC. And I, and I just want to, you know, emphasize that this success that we're seeing here in the third year of DFC, in the third year of DFCC, when you look at mustard, is actually the culmination already of 12 years of research. Uh, mustard started in growing one, in, uh, in growing forward one and growing forward two. And, you know, the culmination of that is we've got the first hybrid brown um, AEC Brown being released in, in 2019. And in this year, completely different breeding uh, tool, we have um, Muster 21 is going to be releasing the yellow condiment, um, AEC Yellow. So really significant developments in terms of um, enhanced varieties going out to, out to producers. The yellow, the, the AEC Brown has a 20% increase in yield. Mustard Yellow has a 9% and these are probably the most significant increases in yield that the mustard growers have seen in over 30 years. So very significant advances going on within the cluster. Another interesting advance is with quinoa. And what's interesting is uh, this is uh, spearheaded by Northern or Northern quinoa production is this variety here, the Salicito is the top selling um, export of um, quinoa in the world. It's, uh, it's from Peru, it's called Salicito. You can see how sparse the growth is. This on the right is the Canadian adaptive varieties for quinoa. You know, the yield is significant, it's reduced saponin, so you don't get that soapy taste, and they're adapted to the Canadian envir um, environment. And there's gonna be three new varieties being released within this five-year program. So this is a significant improvement from a Canadian perspective. The other uh, theme within the uh, DFCC is agronomy and crop protection. And this is really where we're looking at, um, I guess these are more long-term projects, is evaluation of herbicide tolerant varieties in the Canadian environment. You know, we're looking at a significant crop rotation project. Uh, we're in year four of a five-year study, looking at, you know, uh, carbon sequestration, nutrient utilization, um, and the impact, if you put one crop in, what's the impact on the previous crop, on the diverse field crop, and then what impact does it have on another crop going forward? So there's going to be a lot of interesting data coming out of this at the end of five years. And of course, one of the key things that we do have to look at is um, heavy metal uptake, particularly cadmium, because on the international market, cadmium is of concern to um, Canadian um, users of both hemp and flax. So we're looking at, you know, what varieties of hemp, what varieties of flax have minimal cadmium uptake because Saskatchewan Canadian soils have a natural um, level of cadmium. So this is also an important project. Don't really have any um, data to show on this one, but just know that these projects are ongoing. The third is value add. These are unique um, crops. You know, we're looking at seven special 
projects and uh, it's important to look at what needs to be done or what understandings or what work needs to be done so that you can um, have access to, to, to markets both uh, domestically and internationally. And what we're looking at primarily is um, projects here that uh, provide data substanti to substantiate regulatory approval. So we're looking at uh, nutritional, functional, and sensory characteristics of canary seed, quinoa, and mustard proteins and fiber, developing processes to increase shelf life, and expanding the use of special crops. Uh, a couple of successes, and, and this is one that's key for canary seed. Canary seed received novel food approval in 2016 and has yet to see any real market penetration. And so one of the primary projects is how do you stabilize canary seed growths? Um, they contain a high oil content similar to oats. And so the project has had, some, has had success in thermal processing of canary seed growth so that we can develop flowers that are thermally stable for the consumer and therefore can go into the marketplace. And then quinoa, you know, I showed you the, the three varieties, but they're three different colors, red, black, and white, coming into some really unique products. The varieties that have been developed have unique functionalities. Um, they've been able to divide, um, look at five different varieties that have uh, unique functionalities that will get then um, allow it to go into very specific food applications. So that's really exciting um, from a market perspective. Of course, um, like all the other clusters, knowledge transfers and a component com is an important component of DFCC. We don't have the same experience, uh, for instance, like um, the beef group um, gave it a really good example of how knowledge transfer has related back into projects for them, but I can envision that the information that's being uh, produced here in this cluster and being transfer, uh, transferred to the producers is going to allow future projects to come back into DFCC for another cluster. So, you know, we've got combinations of, of videos that have been produced, um, you know, information that's gone out in the Western producer. And then of course, the actual crop sector members themselves here, Manitoba Crop Alliance and Mustard are showcasing what can be, what's being done from a research perspective and encouraging uptake by producers and providing that information to producers. So moving forward, um, like the other clusters, we're basically just starting um, discussions as to what a diverse field crop cluster would look like going forward. Uh, we held a research day in March 2020, just before COVID hit, I think one week before shutdown right across the country. And it was a really unique opportunity for the principal investigators of all seven crops to come together, as well as a number of stakeholders to say, you know, what are the issues and challenges, the challenges that we're experiencing right now with the crops that we're working with and how can we actually collaborate and create greater synergies amongst all the crops themselves to tackle issues common to all the crops. And what's come out of those discussions from last March and then some of the discussions that we've had now and we'll continue to have consultations going forward is three basic areas, variety development, sustainability, and, and, and value add. And I'll just go into um, a little bit more detail about each one of those. So from a variety development perspective, I think I've emphasized already, but variety development is crucial to the growth and development of the small acreage crops. Um, they need genotypic and phenotypic data to make the crops more competitive on the international market to make it economically viable, to make them profitable to producers, and to make it appealing to end users so that you can have that market pull throughout the consumer, you know, I guess throughout the whole value chain from, fork, uh, from farm to fork. So we're looking at quality traits. You know, this, these are basically market driven. You know, what is sea size important? What is the composition in terms of protein? fiber, oil components, functionality, and what very specific applications can it go into. We're looking at agronomic traits in terms of yield, days to maturity, disease, weed and, and herbicide resistance, and specifically those that are adapted to the Canadian environment, but specifically thrive and contribute again to um, producer profitability. 
what also is important again is you know having these varieties very specifically adapted to the Canadian environment. What what is what we're finding and where the real interest is is these are small acreage crops that have been you know they've progressed because of conventional breeding. Now we've got all these really unique advanced breeding tools and genomic tools that these crops need to take advantage of and that will allow um, genomic, to, I guess, to develop genomic technology specific to these crops. And a good example is mustard, the brown mustard, there was an adaptation of a hybridization technique. The yellow mustard was a totally different technique that had to be developed in order to allow yellow mustard new varieties, you know, to come to fruition. Um, what's come out also is that you can do all the genomic tools and marketer analysis that you've got but what you really need is how do you incorporate that genetic information into breeding programs that actually accelerate crop um, improvement. And one of the key discussion points at the research meeting was, this, you know, what do we do with these bioinformatic resources? How do we tap into them? And how can we really start to analyze the data that's coming forth? The next uh, goal for, I think, for the next um, cluster has to do with sustainability and, and that encompasses both um, environmental issues as well as climate change. What's interesting is, is what does the definition of sustainability mean for small acreage crops? Um, it could be different than what sustainability means for wheat, canola or pulses. So I think that's something that is going to have to be discussed and defined. Really what is important is, you know, how do we enhance agronomic practices to support producer profitability. And this is coming forth in our, in our hemp project where you know, different environmental practices, different genomics and management practices all impact um, varieties and profitability for consumers. So how do we mitigate that and, and what information can be provided to producers to enhance their profitability? Uh, first, another one, again, as I indicated was you know, how do small acreage crops mitigate the impact on environment and climate change? And, you know, we're looking at crop rotations, intercropping, carbon crops, um, carbon sequestration, reduced use of crop protection products, nutrient and water utilization, and of course, cell, soil health. So all those things that were discussed at Ag Canada's uh, uh, climate uh, workshops in the last couple of weeks are, are things that I think that the small acreage crops can play a significant role in. And I think one of the things that we have to understand is that with sustainability and with changing climate and with climate change, is you have to recognize, well, what new challenges are going to emerge? And we're already finding that challenges are happening just by introducing new crops into the crop mix. And this is evident, uh, quinoa had an interesting experience where for the first time ever in, in growing quinoa in Canada, they were infested with the sugar beet root aphid. And you know, it, it affects sugar beet, but somehow it's being attracted to quinoa. So there's a whole other challenge that needs to be investigated. Of course, value add plays a significant role um, in creating value to producers and to the whole agri-food industry in Canada. And I think there has to be a recognition that these special crops provide unique sources of protein, starch, oil, fiber, and bioactives um, that are not yet fully explored and offer lots of potential um, into the expansion, into the food, feed, fiber, industrial market, na um, natural health product market. And a lot of the issues that are being uh, looked at right now is, you know, how do you make health claims? How does the information that we can work out into our projects feed into the regulatory world. And I think Julia, Julianne addressed some of the challenges with pulses. Well, these special crops are way down in, in getting the um, evidence to support any type of, um, of uh, nutrient uh, function claim or you know, health claim. Flax, I think, is a, is a really good example of the work that was done in, in their health claim. What can we do with hemp? What can we do with some of the other crops? Um, I just want to point out, you know, that new seed uh, with their carinata, which is a brassica, is, is really being taken up for aviation fuel. So again, moving things into the industrial world, 
You've got hemp opportunities into composites, which I think is, is another area that needs to be investigated. And of course, um, you know, for crops that don't meet the food caliber, how can we move those crops as into feed and how do we work through the regulatory system that way? So lots of opportunities going forward. Um, these are our current collaborators. You can see we're quite extensive. We've got lots of agencies involved in the research cluster itself. Um, Western Grains Research Foundation, as Garth indicated, does fund four of our projects and uh, it's, it's really good to see that involvement. We're funded by all four, three governments across Western Canada, a number of different universities. But like Amy was talking about, and, and also, also Julia, um, Julianne was, you know, how do we collaborate with one of the other clusters, but also find those unique or common issues that could um, go across all clusters that we could collaborate in. So I'm looking forward to more discussions uh, amongst the clusters themselves and amongst, uh, you know, future stakeholders. And I would invite any other interested parties to contact Diverse Field Crop Cluster and Ag West is to see how we could uh, collaborate and move forward with another cluster going forward. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to talk and I'd welcome any questions. Thank you very much for uh, that presentation, Caroline. It's definitely giving us a lot to, to think about. I will also add that uh, it's always great to hear uh, su success stories like the ones you've uh, highlighted for uh, uh, mustard and, you know, uh, as it relates to uh, a variety of development. So thank you very much uh, uh, for, for those. I'd like to once again thank uh, all of our uh, panelists for uh, their presentations. I will now uh, open the Q&A session for attendees. So once again, uh, attendees are invited to ask their questions using the Q&A button that's found at the bottom of uh, their screen. If you would prefer to ask your question verbally, uh, feel free to use the raise hand uh, button. We'll be uh, monitoring the, the list of participants and asking you to uh, unmute uh, yourself uh, to ask uh, your questions. So I'll start, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, one question um, that we've asked our, um, our panelists on uh, Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we, we had the opportunity of uh, hearing from uh, Mr. Tom Ross, who's the uh, ADM for uh, Market and Industry Services at the AAFC. And one of the things he mentioned was that, uh, as you know, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership is coming up in 2023, and uh, AAFC was looking at uh, how, it, uh, how it could evolve uh, over time and uh, looking at starting that uh, stakeholder engagement process to uh, gather feedback from across uh, the sector. Um, so, so the question that was asked to our panelists on Wednesday, and I think would be worth asking you uh, as well, is uh, as the government looks uh, to renew its uh, the partnership after 2023, what do you think are some of the consideration that uh, the government should uh, keep in mind? And whether it's uh, things to change, uh, things to, to keep the same, uh, any, any thoughts on that? We'll start with uh, Amy and then go to uh, Julianne next. I would say, one thing they really need to keep in mind is around priorities, how their priorities line up with uh, industry priorities. I know that's something that that has been a challenge for many in the past. Their their sort of priority setting timeline is not exactly the same as ours. I know that we tend to have priorities and they don't always line up perfectly with the governments. And as a partnership program, it's that's the whole point of the agricultural partnership that I think that there needs to be a bit more collaboration between industries and government as to how we can meet in the middle, if necessary, on, on those priorities that may not exactly line up perfectly. That's kind of the, that would, there's a lot of pieces about the cluster that could be improved. There's a lot of things that are really great about it, but I, I would really like to see the priority setting meet a bit more in the middle of, in more of a partnership kind of fashion. Right. Thank you, Amy. Julian? So I, I touched on this a bit in my presentation. Maybe I'll just take the opportunity to sort of reiterate it. And that is, um, you know, when we've asked processors and, and food manufacturers what, what kind of research, um, you know, governments can do and, and associations can do that is really needed and will really support them, they always highlight to us nutrition and health. Um, and, and that's really a priority for them. Um, they, these are areas where they want a more neutral body to take the lead and, and build some credible um, evidence that they can build off of. 
And so I know that in the past, historically, this has um, perhaps been more of a priority for, for the government and, and agriculture um, Canada, but it seems that, you know, we really um, kind of moved away from it um, recently. And, and we have a big focus on sustainability, which I think is important, but recognizing that still, and I, this was, um, you know, in my presentation, that for consumers, the primary driver is still nutrition and health. Um, and I think that's even more important for consumers now um, after um, experiencing COVID, um, that, that, that that's a really uh, key, key issue and, and challenge that people are focused on. So just, I guess, the recognition that um, there is a, a need to um, produce this information and, and um, generate data on how these foods and, and these crops that are used to, to process the foods, how they're contributing to uh, nutrition and health. Um, so I think that that, that would be um, the message um, that I would emphasize. Thank you, Julianne. Uh, Gart, anything you would like to add? After seeing three uh, evolutions of the agri-science uh, clusters, especially. Well, maybe keep it brief for now and we can always go into more of the history if you'd like, Carl. Uh, not too much to add. I, I'd say for us, our perspective is uh, you'll un understand Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's priorities, uh, recognizing you know they're, they're coming from a, a broader government portfolio of, of priorities and, and look at where the sweet spot is where we can collaborate. Uh, we've been doing this with a number of funding partners, provincially and uh, regionally and nationally. And so what we tend to do is identify those areas where we do have common interests and collaborate and uh, you know, move forward in that regard. So uh, yeah, we'll be looking for the signals from Ag Canada moving forward as to what is most important. I think they've already given those in a very broad perspective and then you know, identify where, there's some, where those interests overlap and move forward that way in that regard. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Carolyn? Well, I think the diverse field crop cluster is the new kid on the block. Um, this is our first time uh, being a cluster, and I would say it's been an interesting process learning exactly how to work with a with a Canada and, and the requirements just from a cluster program. Um, and and I think you know DFCC is in a unique position in that we have we have an extra layer. We've got we've got seven highly involved crop sector members, um, you know, and so when we look at Ag Canada priorities, many of their priorities already fit with our sector, individual sector priorities. The challenge is, is, you know, how much money can our crop sector members put into those priorities when they themselves have producer priorities as well. So I think it's, it's like Gar said, it's, it's a balancing act, you know, going forward, um, the importance of Ag Canada funding, I think has been critical to this cluster and has moved the, the crop sector members to a point where they would not have gone without any agri-science agri support. So um, going forward, I think like Gar says, it's just finding that sweet point and working with our crop sector members, new crops, new stakeholders, how can we evolve to move the whole industry forward? So um, like I said, we're, we're open to discussions, to more collaboration and just seeing how we can work better together. Thank you very much. Claire, speaking of collaboration, that has been a, a recurring theme, I would say, across uh, the, the presentations today and also the presentations that we've heard uh, previously. And on Monday, we've had a chance to hear from uh, the uh, ICED superclusters and some of the agri-science uh, clusters presentation that we've heard on, on Wednesday. Um, they've told us that they, they engage in some form of uh, collaboration or, or partnership with some of the uh, super clusters, for example, with the advanced uh, manufacturing or precision AI uh, super clusters. I'm wondering if uh, some of you have uh, interactions with uh, the super clusters and if you could describe uh, what they what they look like and what that entails. Would anyone like to go first? Julianne? Sure. Um, so yeah, I can touch on that. Um, I think as everyone's probably aware, um, with Protein Industries Canada, there are different pillars. Um, we've really um, looked at opportunities under that capacity building stream um, to collaborate um, with, with PIC um, for some of the, the, the projects that are 
um, kind of, uh, you know, challenges or, or common um, issues or priorities across the sector. Um, and so, um, you know, there are, there are a couple um, projects. Um, one, I, one is still sort of under development, but, um, you know, I, I think it's just, um, you know, our, our um, role at, at Pulse Canada allows us to engage with uh, directly with a lot of different industry stakeholders. So it's easy for us to identify sort of those issues that bubble up and that we're hearing sort of across the board. And then, uh, you know, I know that um, with Protein Industries Canada, there's a lot of focus on the more proprietary projects, um, you know, where they're working directly with specific companies, um, you know, on, on something that, you know, provides them a competitive advantage or a real drives a real um, unique commercial interest. But I think that that's where there's the opportunity for the, the synergy or the collaboration where we can come with sort of the, the broader perspective from across the board um, and, and get some of those projects moving forward. Thanks, Julianne. Anyone else have uh, thoughts on, on that question? <laughs> Hearing none, uh, I, I, I do have uh, one uh, third and final question. Um, I don't know what, like, let me, let me, let me, let me fr uh, phrase it this way. Uh, so on Wednesday, uh, one of our speakers spoke about uh, um, the presence of a few silos with uh, research that's conducted with uh, AAFC as it related to, uh, uh, to his cluster, in a sense, uh, saying that the research that they do is good, but maybe not always focused on what certain producers would see as, as being a priority. I'm wondering if you could comment on your interactions with uh, researchers at AAFC, and not just the, the negative, but also including the, the positive. And I would also like to ask you uh, about uh, public-private uh, partnership and collaboration. Are there challenges there or aspects that uh, could be improved? And if so, uh, what would those be? I can comment on the uh, working with A Canada researchers. Most of our cluster projects are led by A Canada researchers, and we've seen a increase in collaboration and discussion with Ag Canada because of that. So the clusters has definitely um, brought us together on some issues. I know that we've seen a lot of just more discussion since the since the cluster started, especially on breeding, specifically with in the potato sector. They've had a lot more discussion and a lot more collaboration than ever before. So I think that's helped with with not being in that silo sort of scenario, there has been a lot more discussion. So it has been, I think it has been quite beneficial for us in that way. Thanks, Amy. I'll be positive <laughs> on that front. <laughs> Thanks. I'll, just, um, I'll make a comment in that, you know, from the DFCC perspective, Ag Canada has probably the expertise to work with the small, the small acreage crops. Um, you know, when I look at mustard breeding there, they've got the only mustard breeder in Canada. Um, you know, they've got uh, Saskatoon's got, you know, Carinata um, breeding capabilities, the Camelina breeding capabilities that aren't, aren't available anywhere else. So from a DFCC perspective, it's critical that we continue to gauge, engage with, with Ag Canada. And, and um, the, qu the question is, at the level, you know, the upstream versus, you know, the field trialing that needs to get done to finish off variety. So, um, I, Ag Canada has a lot of expertise, and, and I and I envision continued collaborations with them going forward. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, Garth, any uh, any thoughts, and then we'll uh, we'll turn to Julian uh, next. Well, perhaps I'll I'll back up a bit, but I've I've seen over my uh, I guess twenty five to thirty years of involvement in research funding, it's uh, the, collab the collaboration, the knowledge and the relationships that have been developed. And this just isn't related to Ag Canada or clusters, but in general, I think it's just continually improved. When, when I look back, you know, and, and initially there, I, I'd say there's a lot less silos now uh, from a funder perspective, we know each other, we talk to each other, uh, we're, we co-fund in many cases, and if we don't, there's usually a good reason we don't. Perhaps it's fully funded. 
in another way. We share information. Uh, in our in our case, uh, we we like to know if we're if we're partnering on a certain crop that we have an interest in, and uh, we want to know what the producer commissions or the industry associations think of that crop, and make sure that we're involved in issues that are most important to them. We're not duplicating. We're complementing, and uh, you know, so anytime I hear talk, well, researchers aren't collaborating. I think really you need to step back and look at the institutions and the funding because it's the funders that ultimately I think have to accept responsibility. And, uh, and researchers, it's like any other industry. There's some that have great working relationships and work together and there's history and there, there's great work that's done. And uh, you know, others have different perspectives or philosophies. And so it's, uh, there's people in research just like there are everybody else. And I, th I think specifically, though, to the clusters moving from cluster one to two to three, uh, it's really, uh, I remember the first the first cluster, we didn't know each other different, you know, getting together in Ottawa, you started to get to know each other, you started to learn about people and practices and, and, uh, you know, by the time it came to the second one, you could you knew each other better and it was, you could again, learn about best, best practices and continue to grow and Ag Canada's grown with us. And we've got a better understanding what, of what they need because uh, they need uh, us to be successful in order for them to continue to get uh, program funding grants from treasury boards. We be, need to be able to work with them. So I, I've seen a lot of progress on a lot of different fronts when it comes to collaboration so it it leaves me I'm very optimistic about where we're going in the future so sorry a bit of a speech long answer but that's sort of what I've seen over the decades that's great thank you Garth uh, Julian yeah I think I would just echo a lot of of what Garth just said but um, we certainly have a lot of capacity here in Canada um, within um, AAFC scientists, as well as the academic institutions. And, and a lot of that has been built due to, to investments that the government has made um, into research and through all these um, clusters, um, all, the, all the cluster programs over the years. Um, and, and I do think that, um, you know, having, um, you know, breaking down silos and, and sort of um, creating more collaboration and and uh, you know addressing industry priorities I, I think that that's on us that's on the industry associations um, like ourselves to do a better job of of helping the scientific community to understand um, what's happening in the industry and what the industry needs are because they are a, a huge network that um, of stakeholders to support um, the sector and so I think uh, you know it, it really is our job and and I think we could be doing a better job of that Great, thank you very much, Julianne. I'll use my prerogative as a moderator to uh, end the end the presentation or the the panel a little bit early today. Uh, so, Amy, Julianne, Garth, and uh, Caroline, thank you so much again for your presentation and for your uh, insight today. Truly appreciated. And to our audience, uh, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to uh, seeing you again during our next our next and final panel on uh, Monday next week to uh, continue and conclude the conversation. On, uh, on research and innovation in uh, agri-food. Our final panel will uh, feature uh, more of agri-science uh, clusters and also a moderated discussion between uh, Serge Bui, the CEO of AIC, and Mr. Bradwall, the former premier of uh, Saskatchewan, to uh, wrap up the 2021 summit. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.